Welcome back to Media Gito and Southwest Studios. Um, not much to ramble about today. This will be the last video until next weekend, probably. This is Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain by Max Wallace and Ian Halperin. Chapter 7, Part 2. Read and commented on by Media Gito. And uh, before we get into it, if you like this series of videos, go ahead and give me a thumbs up right now. The next time Grant speaks to Rosemary Carroll, she has some news. She tells him that a reporter from the Seattle Times is investigating the possibility that Kurt's death might not have been a suicide, but that Dylan Carlson and Courtney had conspired to have him killed. Grant asks her whether she has the name of the reporter. She tells him that the Seattle chief of police had told this to Courtney's Seattle attorney, Alan Dreyer. She said the Seattle police had apparently poo-pooed the possibility. Carol then urges Grant to contact her husband, Danny Goldberg, about their mutual misgivings over the suicide verdict. She says she wants her husband to realize she is not completely insane for raising doubts about Kurt's suicide. Grant is hesitant, saying that Goldberg is known to be very supportive of Courtney and singing her praises to the media, but Carol is insistent, telling Grant that's just what Goldberg says publicly. A few days later, a few days later, Carol calls Grant to find out how his meeting with Goldberg went. Grant tells her that their encounter was unproductive, explaining that he couldn't really reveal to Goldberg a lot of his strongest evidence for fear of incriminating Carol. Citing an example, Grant says he couldn't tell Goldberg that Carol had given him Courtney's Peninsula Hotel phone records, as well as the get arrested note. Grant says he can understand Goldberg's skepticism and reveals that he is also somewhat skeptical about the whole thing. The last thing he wants to do, he tells Carol, is to create some conspiracy theory like they did with Kennedy, and like they try to do with everybody, if it's not there. Carol asks whether Grant told her husband about some of the incongruities that she had observed about the case. She is particularly skeptical about the claim that Kurt was with Dylan when he bought the shotgun. Carol believes Dylan concocted the story. But Grant tells her he thinks it was a waste of time talking to Goldberg because it was obvious that Goldberg doesn't want to hear anything Grant has to say. Since he last talked to Carol, Grant has hired two document examiners to analyze the unsigned note he and Dylan had found on the stairs of the Lake Washington house. Their conclusion was that Callie had written it. Grant shares his impressions with Carol, explaining that when he picked up the note from the stairway of the Lake Washington house, he thought it sounded phony. Carol concurs, telling him she also thought the note sounded terribly phony. Grant tells her it sounded like a setup letter explaining that when he found the note, he had no doubt that Callie had written it, but that it still looked strange to him. The note just didn't make sense. Carol agrees. She believes it wasn't a sincere letter, and says she believes Callie wrote it because he knew that Kurt was dead. They continue to talk about Callie's potential role. Grant believes Callie might have found Kurt's dead body in the greenhouse and taken the credit card out of his wallet without reporting what he had found. Carol says she had thought exactly the same thing. By the time of their next conversation, the Seattle Times had published the first article to appear in the media detailing unanswered questions about Cobain's death. Kurt Cobain's death a month ago wasn't the open and shut suicide case Seattle police originally indicated, the article began, before detailing some of the inconsistencies. In this article, Dylan Carlson asked why he didn't look for Kurt in the greenhouse when he went searching with Grant on April 7th, tells the Times reporter that he didn't know there was a greenhouse above the garage. For all the times I had been there, I didn't even realize there was a room above it associated with the house, Dylan is quoted as saying. When Grant calls Carol after this article is published, he tells her that Dylan had denied knowing the greenhouse was even there. That's a lie, Carol responds. 
That day, Grant calls Times reporter Duff Wilson to let him know what Dylan had told him about the greenhouse on April 8th after they heard Kurt's body was found, that it was just a dirty little room above the garage where Kurt and Courtney stored lumber. Dylan subsequently receives a call from Wilson asking about the apparent contradiction, which prompts Dylan to call Grant. He is clearly upset. He says the article implies that Dylan was concealing something because Grant said he knew about the room above the garage. Grant reminds him of their conversation immediately after the radio reported Kurt's body had been found in the greenhouse. When Grant asked, what's the greenhouse? Dylan had replied, it's the room above the garage. To this, Grant asked Dylan why they had never looked there. Dylan recalls the conversation and says it was because he had never thought of it and that he had never actually been inside the greenhouse. Grant notes that Dylan had indeed told him that he had been up there, but that he said there was just some stuff stored up there and that it was just a small room or something. Dylan's memory refreshed. He says, well, yeah, I said it wasn't part of the house. In fact, recalls Grant, Dylan had told him that he had once walked around the greenhouse. Yeah, Dylan agrees. When Dylan accuses Grant of implying to the Times reporter that he knew about Kurt lying dead in the greenhouse and didn't tell anybody, Grant explains that he was simply talking about what happened after Courtney asked him to check the greenhouse. Dylan denies it. Courtney didn't say anything to him about that place. Grant tells him that he had spoken to other people who said they were with Courtney when she asked Dylan to check the greenhouse. Again, Dylan denies it, but Carol sticks to her story. Wow, it's obvious that they're lying, she says to Grant later when he reports this conversation. Meanwhile, the media has published a number of demonstrably false accounts of the events surrounding Kurt's death, relying on anonymous sources, each of whom revealed new facts bolstering the idea that Kurt had committed suicide. On April 12th, for example, the Los Angeles Times reported that after Kurt left rehab, one report had him buying a shotgun and calling a friend to ask the best way to shoot yourself in the head. Esquire reported that before leaving rehab, he had called Courtney at the peninsula on April 1st and told her, No matter what happens, I want you to know you made a really good record. In addition, a number of reports were already claiming that Kurt's death was a result of a suicide pact between him and Courtney. On April 26th, The Globe wrote, Incredibly, at exactly the same time Kurt blew his brains out, police say his wife, Courtney Love, shot herself up with a toxic cocktail of heroin and Xanax. As Grant and Carol discuss this array of false reports, They agree that Courtney must be leaking the false information to the media. Carol says it's amazing that she can do this. And it's got the three stars. We are on page 162 of Love and Death, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So, what to say? This is stuff um, that I've covered. I think Rosemary Carroll thinks that everything is a lie here, whereas Tom Grant realizes that Kurt probably, for example, wrote that note that is not a suicide note, but he wrote that in that it's a journal entry, for example, and not a suicide note, even though that's not mentioned here. Um, You know, they're just going into all the media lies that were spun, all the media misinformation, you know, the desire to get the story right to be first, not right, excuse me, the desire to be first, right, uh, leads to the facts not mattering, okay? Fake news, for example, which you see today, um, to be first, right, to get the scoop, as we say in the biz. People will just print shit that's not true in order to be the first to talk about a certain person, or subject, which is what we see here. Oh, Kurt Cobain killed himself. It was part of a, you know, a a suicide, romantic suicide pact. Uh, He had called friends and asked, what's the best way to shoot yourself in the head? You know, all this kind of shit. And because the media published it immediately, we now have it as truth. Um, Because really, because there was no internet to speak of at the time, 
these various rumors were reported as truth, such as the fact that the fact, such as the the narrative that he killed himself. Was Grant convinced yet? It's difficult to say for sure when I finally came to the conclusion that this was a murder and that Courtney was involved, he recalls. After a while, I had uncovered enough after a while, I had uncovered enough information to remove my last few doubts. Some of them will only come out in court. By May 8th, Grant was ready to, Excuse me, guys, sorry. By May 8th, Grant was finally ready to put Courtney on notice about his suspicions. He sent her a letter hinting for the first time at his doubts. Dear Courtney, I'm sure you know by now that my investigation has been somewhat more active than you might have been aware of. The purpose of this letter is to clarify my position regarding our working relationship. You may recall our trip to Carnation on Thursday, April 14th. I mentioned during the drive that I was beginning to turn over some rocks that I wasn't sure you'd wanted turned over. I asked you if you wanted me to continue digging. Cat, who was in the back seat, said, Oh yeah, she wants to know everything. You responded, Yeah, Tom, do whatever it takes. I want to know everything that happened. Your instructions were clear, so in the days and weeks that followed, I proceeded to do whatever it takes. As the investigation continued, my attempts to get at the truth often seemed to be deliberately hindered. While reading some of the articles being written in newspapers and magazines, I discovered the information being released to the press was inaccurate and often cleverly misleading. I consider the circumstances surrounding your husband's death to be highly suspicious. My investigation has exposed a number of inconsistencies in the facts of this case, as well as many contradictions in sound logic and common sense. I'm required to report such findings as these to the police, so on Friday, April 15th, I spoke with Sergeant Cameron about some of what I've learned so far. As I've experienced in past cases, police detectives don't often welcome the work of outside investigators. I've learned it's somewhat idealistic and naive to think the truth might be more important than professional pride. I've decided to continue working on this case until I see it to its conclusion without additional charge. Attached, you will find an invoice which accounts for the charges billed for our services, including time and expenses. As you can see, prior to my return to Seattle on April 13th, these charges exceeded the retainer amount. However, please consider your bill paid in full. There will be no further charges. As I pursue the truth regarding the events surrounding your husband's death, your cooperation and assistance will be appreciated, but not required. Sincerely, Tom Grant, The Grant Company. Well, let's just pause briefly to examine that. Um, I don't know that I've, I mean, I've read this book once, but um, I don't know that I've actually read this letter in detail since then. And um, man, so Tom Grant is finding all this shady stuff out. He's reporting it uh, as is his duty. You know, you have to remember Tom Grant doesn't really have a dog in this fight. He was hired to do the job that he's doing. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Grant. It's not like he woke up one day and decided to uh, smear Courtney Love's name or um, create conspiracy theories. He was hired. Let's remember, guys. And girls, he was hired by Courtney Love around this, you know, a few weeks before this to find Kurt. Uh, he was tricked. Tom Grant was tricked by Courtney Love. Um, he was used, uh, as he puts it here, my friends. What does he say? I know I paused on that. <clears throat> I discovered the information being released to the press was inaccurate and often cleverly misleading. Okay. And not only was Courtney cleverly misleading the press, she was misleading Tom. She knew at this point she either knew when she called Tom Grant, okay, around uh, April 5th, 6th, I don't remember, you know, you know the time frame, right? Uh, during those four days when Kurt was dead, 
but not found yet. She either knew that Kurt was dead um, or was conspiring to have it happen soon. And she was calling around for help, pretending like she was a grieving wife. Okay. I mean, that's, that's some really, really twisted shit. You know, I know that we all love to sit here and laugh about Courtney and stuff, but you have to understand the cruelty. Now, of course, is this proven in court? No, I am a podcast. All right. Um, but these guys, Max Wallace and Ian Halperin, are alleging some of these charges based on Tom Grant's findings, which he reported to the police, which was then ignored. Um, now, was the Seattle Police Department like paid off by Courtney Love and stuff? I don't think so. I think it's Occam's razor in that case where they don't care about junkies. They resent the attention on the Seattle Police Department. And uh, was the SPD in on it? so to speak. No, they were not. They're just incompetent, which I think Tom Grant points out in all his work, as well as the documentary Soaked in Bleach, where the former police chief, I believe, forgetting his name, but he says he would reopen the Kurt Cobain death investigation if he were still chief of police. And uh, so there was incompetence, there was um, quick press releases, quick statements to the media combined with Courtney's manipulation. Uh, man, it was just an absolute whirlstorm, a whirlwind, however you'd like to put that, of mistruth, of misinformation at this time. And Tom Grant is doing his absolute best. And I was saying it's not like Tom Grant woke up one day and decided he was going to get involved with this. Uh, he didn't really know who Kurt was at the time, I believe. I don't know. That, that's going some ways further back in the book. And so he is doing his diligence as a private investigator, is Mr. Grant, presenting to Sergeant Cameron his findings that this so-called suicide is highly suspicious and inconsistent with um, suicides in Tom's, what, 15-plus years as a PI? He is being ignored by the SPD, being uh, kind of dismissed. Um, yeah. And so here is the letter in which he tells Courtney, I found all this shady shit. I no longer trust you. Um, pay this invoice and we'll call it good because I kind of don't want anything more to do with you. I know that you're a liar and I'm going to continue working on this case. Now, so you just said a lot there, Media Gito. Yeah, I understand. I'm passionate about it. We need to break it down a little bit. And moving right along, let's see what happens. I just figured Courtney would hit the roof after she received this letter, Grant recalls. Instead, he receives a somewhat unusual call a few days later from Courtney, who is in Ithaca, New York at the time, staying at a Buddhist monastery. The last time he had heard from her, on April 25th, she had called Grant from an Arizona health and wellness detox resort called Canyon Ranch, where she told him she was sleeping with her old boyfriend, Billy Corgan, lead singer of Smashing Pumpkins. Billy's so nice, she said. What am I supposed to do? It feels right. This call came only about two and a half weeks after Kurt died, at a time when Courtney was being portrayed in the media as a deeply grieving widow overcome with depression about Kurt's death. The same week that she was with Corrigan at Canyon Ranch, People magazine reported, For now, love is with Francis Bean in Seattle in the quiet lakefront home where Cobain died three weeks ago. She's grieving and trying to absorb everything that's happening to her, says a friend. She's doing well. As can, she's doing as well as can be expected, considering. Years later, after Grant's revelation had already been widely circulated, Courtney came up with a slightly revised version about Courtney's... Excuse me. Courtney came up with a slightly revised version about Corgan's visit, telling a reporter from the Chicago Tribune, after Kurt died, Billy came out to the Canyon Ranch, and he like took care of me for a couple of days, but it wasn't like sex. I kept trying to make him fuck me, but he wouldn't fuck me. Everybody thinks we had something, but I was so fucking high that I would have made the maid fuck me. 
Yet three months after her stay at Canyon Ranch, Entertainment Weekly reported her friends insist that she has not used drugs since entering detox just prior to Cobain's suicide. And she has been encouraging others in her entourage to clean up, even helping a few, including one of Frances Bean's former nannies get into rehab. Now, after she receives Grant's May 8th letter, Courtney calls him again. Courtney, Tom, is this the most insane case that you've had for a long time? Grant, it's pretty bizarre. It's probably even more bizarre than you realize it is. Courtney, how do you mean? Grant, there are so many crazy twists and so many things going on here. Courtney, I mean, it's just so weird that I called you and I thought he was suicidal and now he's dead. Instead of formally cutting off ties, as Grant expected she would do after receiving his letter, she asks whether he can do some investigative work for her on issues completely unrelated to Kurt's death. I realized that she was trying to buy my silence, he recalls. She was pretty transparent about that. At first, I thought of refusing the work, but then I figured that as long as I was working for her... I'd have inside access to her world. I'd be able to keep speaking to Rosemary, and I'd be able to keep tabs on Courtney. Among the assignments Courtney gave Grant during this period was to conduct surveillance on a well-known rock musician she was dating at the time. She wanted to know if he was cheating on her. Grant has asked us not to name the musician out of respect for the privacy of the individual. At one point, Courtney told Grant that a psycho fan had broken into the musician's room and splattered bloody tampons on the walls. The same fan had also left the musician a threatening note with a reference to a nearby mental institution, suggesting that a crazy woman had been responsible. Courtney asked Grant to track down the perpetrator, explaining that her boyfriend suspected Courtney herself of having written the note and vandalizing the room. A couple of weeks later, Courtney finally admitted to me that it was actually her who had splattered the tampons around the room and written the note, Grant recalls. Normally I wouldn't even mention this because it has nothing to do with the Cobain case, but I realized that the phony note could represent a pattern of behavior that may be significant. I got the three stars, y'all. The three stars. Man, chapter seven's a long one, my friends. They must have a lot to say here. And this is going to be a three-parter. You like it more. You have a short attention span. You like being read to. That's all this is. Let's just admit it. You're just a lazy little baby who likes having books read to you, don't you? Yeah, you fucking do. <laughs> Piece of trash. <laughs> All right, I'm going to wrap it up, though, you guys, because Daddy's got to eat some fucking lunch. It's not all about you kids all the time. God damn it. So this has been Media Gito saying have a nice day.